Amen and amen. Well, we're continuing our Easter series. We started last week trying to connect it to our series on Genesis. How does, how does what we've been doing in Genesis over the last year and a half, whatever, connect to Easter? And last week I, I tried to paint the picture that the creation account in Genesis is a temple-building account. That all that was created, the heavens and the earth, were created by God for God. That God did not create a dualistic system. He did not create the cosmos where he was supposed to dwell in some place called the heavens, and we were supposed to dwell in some place called the earth. That all of creation was meant to be inhabited and filled with the glory of God. That God's design, God's intent, and that has not and will never change, has always been and will always be to dwell with his creation. And so the the creation account that we find in Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2 is is a temple-building narrative with plenty of examples from the ancient Near Eastern cultures, other cultures, as they dedicated and built their temples. We can look at their process and we compare it to Genesis chapter 1 and we say, clearly in this ancient context, this is being presented that God is creating the cosmos to be his temple and that Eden is the place where he starts. So so last week we talked about how we got from the garden to the tent, to the tabernacle. That, That Eden was the place where God was dwelling with his imagers. And from there, in partnership and cooperation, God's intent was that mankind would reproduce, would multiply, and have dominion over the earth, that they would extend the reign and the rule of God from Eden Eden, to the rest of creation. It did not happen because of their rebellion and sin. They were removed from the garden. They were removed from the presence of God. But God in his mercy and God in his faithfulness refused and will always refuse to give up on his vision. And so God stays involved. And we see as God calls and creates and forms a people through Abram and his descendants, the nation of Israel is created and formed by God to be the instrument that he uses to once again re-engage that Edenic vision of God dwelling with his people. So they're not in Eden anymore, so where's he going to dwell with them? He's going to dwell with them in the tabernacle, the tent. And and I I tried to lay out for you last week how in in Exodus, as, as God gives Moses instruction on Mount Sinai, we see these incredible parallels between Mount Sinai and the tabernacle and the garden. And they're all intentional. This week I want to talk about how we got from the, temp, from the tent, the tabernacle, to the temple. And that ultimately it's the same concept. The temple is a geographically fixed dwelling place. It's on a mountain. It's again to be the place where the presence of God dwells and meets with his people. The temple started as a thought in the heart of David, the king. David was looking around and said to himself, why should I dwell in this incredible palace? of cedar-paneled wood. Why, why should I dwell in this? And God is now in a tent. See, God was in the tent because when the people came out of Egypt, 
They had to come from Egypt to the promised land, and God had to lead them in gaining victory and dominion over the promised land. Just like Adam and Eve were, were, were told to multiply and re- reproduce and find dominion over the land, the nation of Israel is removed from captivity, and God tells them, go and reproduce, take the land. And God is with them in their midst. And so the tabernacle moved from place to place to place to place as God, in connection and partnership with his imagers, brought them to the land of promise and gave them dominion. Now, at really if not the height, really close to the height of the nation of Israel in the land, David says, I want to build you a temple. And God says, no, not, not for you to do. It's a nice idea. Uh, but you've been a man of war, and you've got blood on your hands, and you're not going to build me my temple. But your son can do it. And so David's son, Solomon, set out to build a temple for the Lord. And the, the, the temple, just like the tabernacle, was set up and designed as a mini cosmos. Just like in the tabernacle, when you walk into the temple, when you walked into Solomon's temple, you would see on your left a giant water basin called, do you know what it was called? It's called the sea. That's what it's called. And right over here, you had a giant uncut rock altar right so so when you walk in into the temple you're confronted with the chaos of the sea and the solidity of the land that was created by god and you're you're taken back immediately to genesis chapter one right and the spirit of god is hovering over the waters of chaos and he calls forth the land so immediately you walk into the temple you're taken back you're forced with creation you, then, then there's the, the basins of purification where you can cleanse yourself so that you can come into the holy place. You come into the holy place, there you've got the table of bread that reminds us that God feeds us, that he called forth the world to produce food. You've got the lampstand. What a beautiful lampstand that was. A, a, an ornate tree of life. Seven lights on it to represent the seven visible lights in the night sky, the five planets, the sun, and the moon. You're confronted with this reality. You've got an incense bowl that describes the reality of our prayers coming into the presence of God. Now, if you could, and, and, and you couldn't, because only the pre- high priest could once a day, or once a year, go into the Holy of Holies, you'd have to walk through the curtain that is embroidered and detailed with cherubim, with flaming swords guarding the access into the holy place, just like in Eden, just like in the temple. You come in, there's the Ark of the Covenant the mercy seat, the cherubim on each side. Inside the ark is the tablets, the word of God. This is where God communicates and speaks to his people. This is the place where God rules and judges. The temple was a mini cosmos. It was a a, a picture of what the world is supposed to be. I, I think that we have trouble with this sometimes because we can read the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, and, and we hear about the temple, and we think about the temple like we think about our churches. Right? So we think that the temple was just a place where people went to go to worship, just like we come to our church buildings to worship. But that's not what the temple was in the Old Testament. That's not how they conceived of it. The temple wasn't the place where the people came to worship. The temple was the place where God dwelled and ruled over his people. The, the, the temple was nothing without the presence of God. We're, we're going to see that this morning as we journey through God's redemptive story. 
So let's look at Solomon and the building of the temple. 1 Kings chapter 6, it says this, In the fourth year, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid in the month of Ziv. In the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the house was finished in all its parts and according to all its spec- spec- specifications. I speak for a living. He was seven years in building it. Now, th- this, this point is emphasized multiple places in Scripture. I, j- I chose this one because it's concise. But, but here's the reality. When Solomon set out to build the temple... And, and, and he laid it out, and he planned it, and he designed it. And it was considered one of the wonders of the ancient world. Unbelievably beautiful. It took seven years to build it. These numbers are not random. There's something intentional about it. You can look back at other ancient Near Eastern cultures. When they would build and dedicate their temples, they did it in a seven-day cycle or a seven-year cycle. This is, they're a part of their cultural context. And where does that come from? See, this connection between Genesis and the building and the dedication of the temple is intentional. You're supposed to draw these connections. So it takes seven years to build it. You got to quarry and shape the stones. You got to mine the precious metals. You've got to construct the, the artifacts. You've, you've got to bring in the lumber. It, it, this was an incredibly expensive and intricate process to build this temple. And for seven years, Solomon and the people labored. And at the end of it, you had a building. You had a holy of holies, you had a holy place, you had an outer court. You had a beautifully constructed, man-made building. But you didn't have a temple. Because it's not a temple until God moves in. So in the seventh year, Solomon prays a prayer of dedication. You get your Bibles, go to 2 Chronicles chapter six with me. We're going to look at a large chunk of this, and I'm going to summarize some of it for time's sake. But at, at the, the day of dedication, at, after seven years, Solomon gathers the people together, and he prays over the temple. And this is what he says. He says, O Lord, God of Israel, There is no God like you, and the heavens are on the earth, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. Who have kept with your servant David, my father, and what you declared to him. You spoke with your mouth, and with your hand you have fulfilled it this day. Now therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, Keep for your servant David, my father, what you have promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel, if only your sons pay close attention to their way to walk in my law as you have walked before me. Now therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant David. But will God indeed dwell with man on the earth? Behold, heaven in the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. I, I love this. In the, in the middle of this prayer, he's just spent seven years and an incalculable fortune building this temple for the Lord to dwell. And yet he has this realization that he cannot control God. This is not him putting God in a box. The, the heavens and the earth cannot contain him. And yet, God's desire is to dwell in the midst of his people. Solomon recognizes this. He says, the the highest heaven can't contain you, how much less the house that I have built. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea. O Lord, my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you. 
that your eyes may be open day and night towards this house, the place where you have promised to set your name, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers towards this place. This, this is the heart of Solomon's prayer. We're asking that you would come and inhabit, you would come and dwell this place, in this place. That as we come to you, as we direct our hearts, as we direct our lives, as we direct our prayers towards you, that from this place, God, you would hear. And from this place, God, you would reign. This is, this is his prayer. He says, listen to the pleas of your servant and your people Israel when they pray towards this place. Listen from the heavens, your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. He, he continues, he says, in, in verse 22, he says, if a man sins against his neighbor, hear his prayers. In verse 24, he says, if your people of Israel are defeated before their enemy and things don't really go well, hear from here. W when the heavens are shut up and there is no rain and drought comes upon the land and we cry out to you, hear God, hear our prayers. In verse 28, when, if there's famine in the land, if there's pestilence, if there's things, and the reality is those would be signs of judgment because of Israel's unfaithfulness. God, let us come here to the temple. Let us come here to your place of rule and reign and hear our prayers. Verse 32 picks up and says, Likewise, when foreigners, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a far country for the sake of your great name and your mighty hand, and your outstretched arm, when he comes and prays toward this house, hear from the heavens your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel and that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. I love that this is a part of Solomon's dedication and prayer. It, it gives us insight into the purpose of the temple. The, the temple is the meeting place of the heavens and the earth. Do you see that connection? So when we come and pray, when a foreigner comes and prays, Lord, you're in the heavens, but you're also here in this temple. This is sacred space. This is where you're meeting with us, God. So when we pray or when a foreigner prays, to this place where you put your name, your very presence, hear us, God. Are you, if you don't hear the echoes of Eden in that, I'm not sure you're paying attention. It, it, continues in verse 34, if, if, if your people go out to battle, hear our prayer. Verse 36, if they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. So it's not really an if they sin, but when they sin, when we sin, God, hear our prayer. This is the place where we come to do business with God. The temple is his house. But the temple is his throne. It's interesting to me, totally not connected to the scriptures at all, but in our culture, the seat of power of our ruler is called a house, the White House. That is the seat of power of the president of the United States. He lives there, but he rules from there. That is the concept of the temple. The temple is God's house where he leverages and exerts his authority and his power on behalf of his people for the sake of the world. 
The temple was where Israel's God dwelt, but not just Israel's God because he is the God of the world. So the temple is the place where the heavens and the earth are again reunited so that mankind, God's imagers, can have access to him. Now, oh my God, let your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayer of this place. And now arise, O Lord God. Come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. Let your saints rejoice in your goodness. O Lord God, do not turn away from the face of your anointed one. Remember your steadfast love for David, your servant. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from the heavens and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. That's when it went from a building to a temple. Because the glory of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, the same glory that was in Eden, the same glory that was on the top of Mount Sinai in thunder and clouds that only Moses went into, the same glory that was in the tent of meeting with Moses when they were building the tabernacle, the same glory and fire that was in the tabernacle as they were led through the wilderness and into the promised land now comes into the temple in Jerusalem. God moves in. Not to take a nap. That's not what resting means. To rule. To engage in his work. For and with his people. That's what the temple was for. So all of Solomon's prayer, it's, it's, it's holistic no matter where we are in life, God, no matter where we come from, no matter what we're experiencing, if things are going well, if things are going poorly, if we've been faithful, if we've been unfaithful, God, this is where we're going to come. We're going to come here to this temple, to this one centralized, localized place, because God, this is where your glory is. And if I need to offer sacrifices, I can offer sacrifices. If I need to offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving, if I, if I need to come and just celebrate who you are, I can come here. If I'm far away and I can't get there, I can turn. I can orient myself towards your temple. And I can call out to you and you'll hear. Because your presence is there. temple not just a building it's the throne room of god where heaven and earth connect and where we have access to god it's a mediated access you have to go through cleansing you have to offer sacrifice you have to come through the priest it's a mediated access because we have a sin problem but it's access. We get to come to God. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. <laughs> when all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces on the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. And it, if you're reading along in the story and you, and you don't know what comes next, you think, this is it, this is it. Finally, we're going to pick up where Adam and Eve started and failed. Finally, we have a new Adam in Solomon, in Israel, in the people. Finally, God and his people are going to pick up that Adamic mandate to spread the glory of God throughout the world. But just like Cain, Noah, just like Abram and Isaac, Jacob and 
12, just like all that had come before. Israel, even with God's presence in their midst, found their hearts turned away from God. God had been straight up with them. If if you stay with me, it's going to be good. But if you go after other gods, if you if you become an adulterous people, if you worship in their high places rather than here in the temple, if you are led astray, I will judge you. Not because I hate you, but because I love you. I will correct you. I will discipline you as a father that loves and disciplines his children. And oh, how the people were led astray. And God was so generous and gracious. So you read the story over He sends the prophets to call them back to faithfulness. And the people just killed prophet after prophet after. We don't want to hear from you, God. We, we've got you in the temple. We, we got this here. But, but we're distracted by all these other things. And over and over and over again, God calls his people back to faithfulness. And over and over and over again, they reject him. And choose to go their own way, just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. And so we're faced with this reality. Once again, even with God's presence, His glory in the temple, His people are not faithful. So Israel is judged. God raises up the Assyrians. The Babylonians, they come and they destroy Jerusalem. Solomon's temple is leveled. And this is what the Scripture says, so that not one stone was left upon another. The ark, the vessels, all the stuff, the gold, the silver, all the beautiful stuff is taken into foreign lands and put in foreign temples. And the people are judged. But God doesn't give up. Right? God is going to be faithful even when we're faithless. Somebody say amen. This is the best news you're going to hear all morning. Because I'm looking at a room of faithless people. And even when we are faithless, he is faithful. So God is judging them. God is disciplining them. But God's not giving up on them. And so he tells them. He tells them through Jeremiah. He tells them through other prophets. You're going to be in exile for a while, but I'm going to bring you back. And, and he does. I mean, he's faithful. After the 70 years in exile, the first remnant begins to come back. Then other remnants begin to come back. And first they build up the walls of protection. And the very first thing they do is begin to construct a temple. Because if they're God's people and they're back in God's place, they need to have the temple where God will meet with them. We find the account of this in Ezra chapter 3. Verses 10 to 13, it says, When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestment came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. Where do we hear that? We just heard that at the dedication of the temple, right? For Solomon. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, even though many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. So the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. Why are they weeping? That God has faithfully led them out? On a foreign king's dime, right? God has brought them a remnant back. 
they've reestablished themselves. They, they've now built this temple. They, they, they rebuild it. But when those who had seen Solomon's temple see this one, they wept. They wept. And some people might say, well, they wept because Solomon's temple was so beautiful, right? It, like it was so beautiful. And this temple was much smaller and it, it wasn't as artistically, aesthetically beautiful. I don't think that has anything to do with it. I think there's one reason and one reason only why they wept. Because even though they laid the groundwork, even though they built the foundation, even though they built a place of stone, It wasn't really a temple because the glory and the presence of God never came and inhabited that place. So you got a building, but you don't have a temple. God speaks to them about this in Haggai chapter 2. He says this, uh, in the seventh month, On the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel. Say that ten times really fast. The son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say this. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong. It's like, I mean, he, he just comes out. and God just lays it out. How, how do you like that? Nothing, isn't it? You got a building. That's it. But be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all ye people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. My my glory is not there, but I haven't given up. You're still my people. The covenant is still in place. Because I'm God. Even when you're faithless, I'm faithful. So be strong. Keep at it. Even though this temple is just a building, keep at it. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and I will shake the earth and I will shake the sea and I will shake the dry land. I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. There's no glory now, but there will be. Silver is mine. The gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the God of hosts. You hear what God is saying to his people? There's a day coming where I'm going to turn everything upside down. I'm going to shake it up. I'm going to shake it up. I'm not giving up, and so you don't give up. To all human appearances, it may look like I've abandoned you, but I'm with you. I'm in your midst. And one day, the glory's coming back. One day, I'm going to take up residence in the temple. And, and the glory that is coming back shall be greater than the glory before. How is that going to be? God doesn't tell us but he promises that the glory is coming. He promises that the glory is coming. Some 500 years later, the building's still there, but there's no glory. A corrupt king of the Jews by the name of Herod, decides that he wants to institute a building program on the temple to curry favor with the Jewish people and to impress his Roman overlords and make everybody know how great of a king he is. So Herod takes this temple that had been built in exile and begins to reconstruct and rebuild and add on to it. 
And Herod begins this project uh, about 18 B.C. he begins. 18 years before Jesus is born, he begins. And for decade after decade, while Jesus is on the earth ministering, he's still building. While Jesus dies and is raised again, there's, it, it continues on for a decade or so after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. They keep building and building and building until in 70 A.D. the whole thing is destroyed. And in all that time, with all that building and modification and enhancement, and there was still no glory in the Holy of Holies. God's presence was not in that building of stone. And yet God was faithful. And the glory did come. Well, this is why John starts his gospel. We have beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth. In Jesus, the greater temple has come. This is, God has once again taken up his residence in the world. The glory has manifested on the earth, but now not in a temple made by men out of stone, but in the temple of a body. God comes as one of us. The glory, the presence, the name of God manifests in our midst. That's why John says Jesus came and tabernacled. The word just literally means to dwell. He, I like how Eugene Peterson says it in the message. He moved into the neighborhood. God moved into the neighborhood. Where Jesus was, heaven and earth met. And all the things that could be done in the temple were now able to be done through Jesus. What did Jesus do? He heard prayers. He healed the sick. What did Jesus do? He fed the hungry. He loved the foreigner. What did Jesus do? He forgave sin. And he invited people to access the Father. What did Jesus do? He gave peace. All that the temple was built to do was now in the greater glory of Jesus. The incarnation in our midst. So I started the service with Matthew 21, verses 1 to 11, the triumphal entry. Jesus comes into Jerusalem, seated on the colt to fulfill the prophecies. He comes in humility, but make no mistake, he comes as king. He comes to establish the royal rule of God on the earth by releasing his people from the corruption and consequence of sin that is death. He comes as the king to take it upon himself. And as he rides into town, the people are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, God save us! And what they meant was, it's go time. Let's get the army, polish the swords. The king is here and he's going to lead us into battle and we are going to take the Romans out. God had really no desire to take the Romans out. The Romans were going to take themselves out. Jesus came for a much bigger enemy than Caesar. So they're crying out, save us, save us. The the problem is they got expectations of what that looks like. Save us the way we want to be saved. At the time that we want to be saved, for the purposes that we want to be saved for. One minute they're crying, save us, save us. Five days later, the vast majority of the crowds are crying out, crucify him, crucify him. We want nothing to do with him. We have no king but Caesar. 
at Forge this week. I was teaching on this triumphal entry, and a- afterwards, one of the, the kids came up to me, and they said, um, how did they go from singing Hosanna to shouting crucify him? That's a great question. We've got to keep reading in the story. Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. So now remember, you've got a three-part temple. You've got the outer court where everybody can come in. Right? The outer court is primarily designed for the foreigner the God-fearers, the Gentiles that have heard and seen the beauty and the glory of Yahweh who have come to the temple searching for the true God. And remember, back in Solomon's prayer, that's what it's designed for. That's what God wants it to be. The temple doesn't belong to the Jews. It belongs to God. And it's not simply for the Jews, it's for all people. So the outer court is where the Gentiles are supposed to be able to come and worship, be able to come and pray, be able to come and hear and see God. But instead, commerce has taken over. So people are coming from a long way, and it's not an easy thing to bring your own sacrifice, bring your own goat, bring your own pigeons, bring your own whatever. So the whole outer court has now been filled with stalls and animals, and and you come in and you barter. You're picking, I want to get the good lamb, but I want the cheap lamb. You know what I'm saying? Like we, a whole thing's going on. uh, How much for these pigeons? How much for this? And it's chaos. It's chaos. It's not what it's designed to be. And the, and the Gentiles that are coming to worship, they can't go into the next, the holy place. They can't go in there. Only Israel can go in. So that, This is all they got. And when they get there, they're not confronted with God. They're confronted with commerce. It's chaos. Now Jesus comes in, he starts flipping over tables, he's just whipping people and money changers, casting them out, and he says to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. The the temple was designed, and, and that outer court of the temple was designed for the foreigners to come and pray and find God, and instead of finding God, They're getting ripped off by God's people. And every televangelist should tremble when they read this. They should tremble. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. What's happening? They come to him, the true temple. And he does what the temple was supposed to do, be the meeting place of heaven and earth, the place where our needs could be brought before God and where God could move on our behalf. So he clears it out so that the people can actually have access to God. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, what an exercise in missing the point. This is one of those texts that reminds us perspective is so important. Because, I mean, I read this, I'm like, Jesus is healing blind people. He's making lame people walk. Like, miracles are happening. God is showing up. And the, and the chief priests and the rulers, the religious elite, they're looking at it, and they're not going, that's awesome! <laughs> Which is what they should have been doing, right? Like, dude, if I could do that this morning... Like, if I could take somebody that was blind, and, and then they could see, you, you should look at that and go, wow, like, that's insane. That's not what they do. The children are crying out. Everybody's excited. And, and they come to Jesus, and they're like, because the children are saying, Hosanna to the son of David, and they were indignant. 
How dare you perform miracles on behalf of the people? How dare you turn the temple into a temple? And they said to him, do you not hear what they're saying? It's an accusation. It says they're, they're, they're saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're saying, here's the son of David. They're saying, this is David's descendant. And he was. And he is. This is, the, this is the king. Being called the son of David is to be called the king. And they're like, do you hear what they're saying? And Jesus is like, yeah, have you not read? <laughs> Which is just a flat-out insult, right? These are the scribes and the teachers of the law. So when Jesus says to them, have you not read? That's like saying to your accountant, did you not take math? <laughs> have you not read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. So that's part of the reason why they went from Hosanna to crucify him. He was messing with their economics. He got into their wallet. He called them out on their willful ignorance and blindness. And just the fact of his presence and the glory that was in and through Jesus revealed their lack of God's presence. So, in the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. What a mind-blowing statement that is. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it, and found nothing on it but only leaves. So the, the way the fig tree works, like there, there should have been fruit that time of year. It was producing leaves. There should have been fruit there. So he sees this fig tree. It's got the leaves. It's telling him, hey, there's fruit here. So it's false advertising. <laughs> no, it is. Like this is, like this is one of those texts that you read or you hear in Sunday school, and you're like, why did Jesus hate fig trees? totally missing the point. So, so he said to it, he talked to the tree, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. It withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, how does the fig tree wither at once? Which I find interesting because they just saw him healing blind people. They just saw him making lame people walk. And they're like, well, how do you, how's that? But the point is, there's more going on here. Jesus is a prophet. And the prophets, one of the things they love to do is make visual illustrations of their prophecies. Jesus answered them, truly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not now, do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And you're like, okay, Jesus, whatever. Let's keep reading and get to the good stuff. Dudes, this is the good stuff. So we, now, you, you can turn this into some American prosperity garbage, right, and say, Jesus here promises, right? We can tell that mountain to move, and it'll move. But think with me. What mountain is Jesus next to? The Temple Mount. Why is the temple on a mountain? Because in the ancient Near East, where do the gods dwell? On a mountain. Where did God meet with Moses? On a mountain. Where was Eden? On a mountain. Jesus is saying, 
Do you see me curse that fig tree? Because I looked at it, it promised me something that it didn't give me, so it's done. And now this mountain, it's not talking about some random mountain. You don't get to go out to the white tanks and go, move. Like, go ahead, try it. Just like this mountain, this temple mount promises access to God, but God's not there. God's here. Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. What was the temple to be? The place where you prayed and God heard. And now Jesus said, I saw that temple. If you have faith, and you pray, you will be heard because the new and greater temple is with you. Guys, do you see this? When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Because Jesus was in their turf, right? And Jesus says, um, well, I also will ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. <laughs> so you don't want to play like games with Jesus. So uh, the baptism of John, where did it come from? In other words, you want to talk about authority. Where did John's authority come from? Right? John, the baptizer. John, the weirdo in the desert, eating locusts and honey. John, who when he saw me said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Where, where did John's baptism, where did his authority come from? Did it come from the heavens or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, Well, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we're afraid of the crowd, for they all thought that John was a prophet. So Jesus traps them. Right? They, they can't answer. Because if they say John's authority came from God, then he's like, well, why did you ignore him? And if they say from man, well, then they're going to lose their power structure because everybody thought that John was a prophet. That's a lose-lose scenario for them. <laughs> So they answered, Jesus, um, yeah, we don't know. And he said, well, then I'm not going to tell you what authority I do these things. And then he tells them. What do you think? A man had two sons. He, he went to the first and said, um, son, go and work in the vineyard today. Pretty straightforward. And the son answered, uh-uh, I will not. But later, he changed his mind and went. So here, here you got the first son. He's the bad son. The father comes to him and says, do something. No way. I'm not going to do what you say, old man. I'm busy on TikTok, and I don't know. I got, I got things to do. So he went to the second son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. Right? This is the good son. Yes, father. Happy to serve you, father. I'll take care of it. But then he didn't go. So here's, here's the bad son that flat out says, no, I'm not going to do it. But then actually, in retrospect, comes back and does it. And the good son who says, yeah, I'm totally going to do it, but doesn't do it. Jesus says, which of the two did the will of the Father? And they said, well, the first. And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. Oh, they said no. 
they they they're living life their way, but they repented and they came and and did it. And you, on the other hand, oh, you love to stand up in the courts and pray in front of people. You love everybody to know how religious you are. You tell every you talk a really good game, but you don't actually do the will of the Father. So it's. It's the marginalized, it's the sinners, it's the broken, it's the outcasts, it's the people that you in your religion despise that will actually enter the kingdom of God. So John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. The tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. In Jesus, we have the very presence of God in the hood. He's moved in. He's here with us. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But to those who did receive them, he gave them the right to be called the children of God. Children not born of human flesh or human will but children born by the very power of God. Church, we've got to get Jesus, not religion. We've got to get Jesus because in Jesus we have access to God. In Jesus, we have a mediator who doesn't have to keep offering sacrifices over and over again. In Jesus, we have a mediator who offers a once-for-all sacrifice. In Jesus, something new has happened. The glory of the Lord, which had been located in one place, the temple was located in one place, place, one central location has now been decentralized. If you want to meet with God, you don't have to go to Jerusalem. If you want to pray to God, you don't have to pray towards Jerusalem. Because the glory of God has come and appeared in the person and the work of Jesus. And if we jump ahead in the story to Pentecost, when Jesus sends his spirit to abide within the temples of his disciples, we see that the work of God has now been set free and decentralized. So that wherever Jesus' people go, Jesus goes. Wherever we are, there is sacred space. Because the heavens and the earth have come together in Jesus And now they've come together in us. If anyone is in Christ Jesus, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. We are this weird, strange, already not yet, where Jesus' people were a part of the kingdom, but not in its fullness quite yet. Where we are, we're still in this world as aliens and strangers, but we're new creations and we're citizens of the heavenly kingdom. We're we're living in this reality where, where we are, the presence of Jesus is because he's put his presence within us. All that God did for his people in Eden, in Sinai, in Jerusalem, in the temple, he now does for us and for all peoples through Jesus. He is the greater temple and the greater glory. And he deserves our worship. Amen. Father, I thank you.